Y'all, it's Monday. We got a lot of news to talk about and break down today, so let's just jump into it. Starting with In news that makes me sometimes wish that I was reporting this in front of a live audience so I could gauge reaction. Derek Chauvin was stabbed in prison and or but he is expected to recover. The Federal Bureau of Prisons on Friday saying that the stabbing happened in Tucson, Arizona. Employees contained the incident and performed life-saving measures before Chauvin was taken to the hospital. Though notably, at the time, they didn't name the inmate in question. But you also had sources telling several outlets that the person who had been stabbed was Derek Chauvin and that he had been seriously injured. And shortly after those reports, Minnesota's attorney general confirmed who it was. So over the weekend, you had the BOP still refusing to identify the inmate who was stabbed or comment on their condition, saying, for privacy and safety reasons, we are not providing the name of the victim or their medical status. And actually, even one of Chauvin's own lawyers said he was unable to get any information from BOP telling reporters the information has been stonewalled and adding, I have reached out to the prison six times and asked to speak to somebody and each time I was rebuffed. Now, despite all that, a spokesperson for the Minnesota AG has since said that Chauvin is expected to survive the attack. And while if you look online, people have varying reactions to the news of the stabbing and him surviving. Regardless of those opinions, this incident has brought renewed scrutiny to the BOP and its inability to protect high profile inmates. Because the BOP has been closely watched and criticized for this in particular in the years following Jeffrey Epstein's death while incarcerated in 2019. And Chauvin's stabbing actually comes after a handful of other very high-profile incidents just over the last few months. Right back in June, the Unabomber committed suicide at a federal medical facility, and in July, Larry Nasser was also stabbed in prison. And according to the Associated Press, this stabbing is also the second major incident at the Tucson Federal Prison in a little over a year. Reporting in November 2022, an inmate at the facility's low-security prison camp pulled out a gun and attempted to shoot a visitor in the head. And adding the weapon, which the inmate shouldn't have had, misfired and no one was hurt. And the outlet also going on to say that it's been conducting an ongoing investigation into the flaws within the BOP that has, quote, revealed rampant sexual abuse and other criminal conduct by staff, dozens of escapes, chronic violence, deaths, and severe staffing shortages that have hampered responses to emergencies, including inmate assaults and suicides. Right, and actually, on that last part, specifically, these incidents have come as the BOP is dealing with a massive shortage of corrections officers requiring the nation's prisons to use teachers, case managers, secretaries, and other facility workers to take on shifts. In fact, a report from this past March found that one in five of the over 20,000 corrections officers' positions funded by Congress were unfilled in September of 2022. Right, so it seems like there's a pretty obvious connection, but as far as if anything's gonna change from here, that remains to be seen. And then, the list of reasons my somewhat elitist ass will not go on a Southwest flight got a little longer over the weekend. And that's because on the Southwest Airlines flight over the weekend that was set to go from New Orleans to Atlanta, this guy all of a sudden just decides, hey, I want off the plane. And rather than mentioning this change of mind to like a flight attendant, he just throws open the emergency exit, he jumps onto the wing and jumps down to the tarmac. Which I will say, while that is shitty, somewhat impressive. My guy was on a Boeing 737. I make that jump, my knees explode. We're not talking about a fracture or a break, my knees would turn into powder. But the other passengers on the plane, they were understandably not impressed. Instead, they were terrified. Right? Because a rumor actually spread, and I don't know if this is true or not that the guy dropped something in the plane before jumping out. And so people started speculating, probably not like candy or treats, maybe a bomb. And so all this is people are trying to get off. They're being told to walk, not run. So there's not a panic. And thankfully from the video that we've seen, they actually deplane without any incident. But then the passengers also look out the windows and they spot the guy from before down on the tarmac. There he is, there he is, there he is, there he is. He's taking the Oh my God, there he is. There he is, right there. And he reportedly tries to hijack a service truck GTA style. Luckily, the airport workers actually drag him from the cabin before he drives away. With a man arrested soon after and delivered to a hospital for evaluation. Now, all that said, as far as people on the flight, they got a story and they departed three hours later. And as for the guy who actually caused the whole scare right now, we don't know why he did it. And then, so you may have noticed over the last week or so, there's been a big wave of a lot of big names being sued for sexual assault. And there's actually a really important reason for that. The Adult Survivors Act. With that giving people in the state of New York a one-year look-back window to file sexual misconduct laws in cases that have passed the statute of limitations. And because the window was opened up Thanksgiving of last year, it closed at the end of last week, so you had people just trying to get in under the deadline. And in fact, according to reports, on October 31st, there were just 803 cases filed in the state Supreme Court. But by November 22nd, that rose to nearly 1,400. And that number doesn't even count cases that were filed in the Court of Claims, which could also accept lawsuits. And so the New York Times estimating that in total, over 3,000 cases were filed during this one-year window. Also, it wasn't just individuals, with reportedly prisons and hospitals being sued for systemically ignoring and hiding abuse with at least 479 lawsuits levying these allegations at Rikers Island, which is a really important thing to mention because, you know, most of the headlines understandably have focused on the prominent figures like celebrities. For example, you had Sean Combs, aka Diddy, being hit with three separate lawsuits accusing him of sexual assault and rape, with most of the allegations stemming from the early 90s, though his reps have denied the claims as fabricated and false money grabs. You also had the likes of Jamie Foxx being sued over a groping allegation from 2015, his reps likewise denying the allegations. You also had Axl Rose being sued for sexual assault by a model over an incident in 1989. 
his reps calling it fictitious. We also saw New York-based politicians being hit. Those including Mayor Eric Adams, who was sued for allegedly sexually assaulting a woman in 1993, which he denies. And former Governor Andrew Cuomo also facing a lawsuit for continuous sexual harassment, which are claims that he's already denied. And so for now, with the cases I got in under the wire, you know, we're gonna have to wait to see what comes from all of them. Though notably, leading up to this, some have already proven successful. Right? I mean, one of the first lawsuits filed under the Adult Survivors Act was E. Jean Carroll's case against Donald Trump, where very notably, she was awarded $5 million after Trump was found liable for sexual abuse. And so with this, of course, you have a lot of people going, you know, it's great that we had the Adult Survivors Act, but at the same time, some fear that this act didn't go far enough and they want more opportunities for survivors to seek legal action. Right? Some saying that a one-year window just didn't provide all the survivors enough time to file claims. And with that, a lawyer telling the Times that she anticipates still receiving more calls from people who wish to exercise their legal rights, but of course, now we're after the deadline. And then, is Disney dying? That's actually a question that my oldest son asked me and it like immediately became clear he had watched like someone's video essay. But it is a genuine question and we are seeing more and more debate on the topic. And that in part because there's been a lot of focus on their shortcomings, starting with most recently its latest film, Wish. Right, because its domestic five-day Thanksgiving opening brought in just over $31 million, which is well behind the $45 million that it was tracking for. But you have some arguing that it's not as bad as it sounds. And that because there is kind of a precedent for animated family films to sort of be slow burns at the box office. With there being other examples like Pixar's Elemental this year really flopping in its first weekends, though ultimately making nearly $500 million worldwide. So there is a chance that could happen with Wish over the holidays. But part of the reason there's an increased focus on Wish is because it follows other Disney box office blunders. With recently the Marvels coming out, which marked the worst opening weekend for an MCU film. And this is other movies like the latest Indiana Jones and Haunted Mansion didn't live up to expectation. And actually on this, Variety noting that not a single movie Disney released in 2023 has crossed $1 billion, which is kind of wild when you consider that in 2019 alone, they made seven films that crossed that mark. Though again, it's not like we're seeing everything flopping. You know, we mentioned Elemental. You also had the Little Mermaid remake starring Halle Bailey bringing in $570 million worldwide. Also, The Last Guardians of the Galaxy brought in an impressive $845 million. But still, given their previous success, you have a lot of people saying this looks like a negative trend. And with that, box office analyst Sean Robbins telling Variety, Disney set an impossibly high bar for itself during the 2010s, firing every cannon in its arsenal, and adding the downside to success is that it becomes expected every time. The studio was always going to be in a challenged position when the well started to run dry. But also with this, you have some arguing, you know, this is just a general trend we're seeing. Some blaming it on the pandemic era reliance on Disney Plus and streaming. With audiences just getting used to watching movies on the couch. Some feeling like unless that specific movie was like a must watch as soon as it came out or there was a reason to see it in a kind of a theater setting, you would just wait. But this is you have others arguing that, you know, Disney's problems are not necessarily reflective of the entire box office this year, right? Noting that other studios have crossed that landmark. Or things like Barbie and Super Mario Bros. Also, I mean, you have Oppenheimer, which notably is an R-rated three plus hour long war biopic getting incredibly close to a billion. But, you know, rather than just continuing to talk about the possible reasons this is happening, I want to pass the question off to you because you, while you're just one, are a person who is affecting this story. Why are you still going to the theater for certain movies? Why are you not? Has that changed over the last five years? I'd love to hear from you. And then, y'all, the holiday season is in full swing, which means that if you're like me, that means a lot of online shopping. But with that, just please make sure that you and your loved ones are doing so safely. Avoid companies tracking and selling your data. And you can actually do that thanks to our fantastic partner and the sponsor of today's show, NordVPN, or more directly, nordvpn.com slash Phil to keep you and your data safe this holiday season. You know, with a bombardment of online banner ads, sidebars, pop-ups everywhere, you need to know that some of these are malvertising ads created to infect your device with malware and viruses. And it sucks that attackers actually create a convincing advert containing hidden lines of malicious code and find a way to feature their content on a legitimate website. You know, when you click on the ad, you'll be directed to a dangerous server from which the rest of the attack will be launched. And that's one of the reasons I use NordVPN's threat protection service. It blocks dangerous sites and limits advertising giving us a cleaner, safer browsing experience. So one, slow down and exercise caution. It is amazing how just safer your experience will be if you just you take a beat. It'll go a long way to keeping you secure, but also two, take control of your internet experience today and go to nordvpn.com slash Phil to get an exclusive deal in four additional months. That's nordvpn.com slash Phil and it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. And then choosing money, over people. That is not just the message of so many of my favorite rap songs, except Eminem songs, which is, I have mommy issues. But it is also a real life truth, whether it be uh, on an every person level, all the way to the highest levels of government and power. The most recent and high profile example of that is coming out of New Zealand. Because you might remember New Zealand's former Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern's government introduced the world's first generational smoking ban last year, which would have made it illegal for anyone born 2009 and after to purchase cigarettes legally. You're born before 2009, you're grandfathered in, after, sorry. 
Sorry. And that law was designed to do two main things, to prevent thousands of smoking-related deaths each year and actually save a ton of money. With a recent study saying this ban, along with measures meant to make smoking less affordable and accessible, would actually save $1.3 billion in health system costs over the next 20 years. However, our has gone bye-bye. And so with the appointment of the new Prime Minister, Christopher Luxon, a plan's been announced to reverse the tobacco restrictions. And while Luxon, you know, didn't campaign on the idea of repealing this ban, he notably did form a coalition with populist right New Zealand First, who reportedly insisted upon the tobacco restrictions reversal. And the primary reason for this comes down to dollars, right? because this coalition wants tax cuts. And the new finance minister, Nicola Willis, said that the revenue from cigarette sales will go towards the tax cuts. And saying, coming back to those extra sources of revenue and other savings areas that will help us to fund the tax reduction, we have to remember that the changes to the smoke-free legislation had a significant impact on the government books, with about $1 billion there. And Luxon also going on to say the reversal will prevent a black market from popping up and stop shops from being targeted by thieves. But it really does come down to the money. Right? Because while $1.3 billion was expected to be saved in the healthcare system, it is really nothing compared to the $2 billion that goes to New Zealand from tobacco taxes every year. Though notably, those calculations exclude the human cost, the thousands of lives that will be lost to this addiction. Which is why you have health officials calling this reversal a serious loss for public health and a win for the tobacco industry. And so for now, yeah, you have people eyeing what's going to happen in New Zealand, but you also have people wondering what's going to happen elsewhere. Because it is important to note, while New Zealand was the first, we actually saw other countries jump on this idea of generational bans. With, for example, the UK introducing a general ban on tobacco products modeled after New Zealand's legislation, and a spokesperson for the UK Prime Minister saying they remain committed despite New Zealand's reversal. But that is just one of several, so we'll have to wait to see. And then, you gotta trust me on this, we need to talk about apples. Because Americans have so many fucking apples right now, it could either upend the economy or or solve the country's hunger. And to really understand this, we just need to take a look at three major factors. First thing you need to know is that U.S. Apple exports have actually been declining for a while now, falling 21% over the past decade. With that, partly because of tariffs from India, so you had the U.S. domestic market already saturated. Secondly, you have to consider that recent hailstorms damaged some of the year's harvest. While that doesn't necessarily make them inedible, it does make them too ugly to be sold on the fresh market. Because we as Americans, not just superficial about people, but also food. And so usually what then happens is that growers resort to processors who turn the fruit into applesauce, apple juice, and other products. But this year, that really wasn't an option because of the third factor, oversupply. It turns out that last year's harvest was so huge that prices dipped and buyers took advantage of that by purchasing more than they needed. And so they just put leftover fruit in climate-controlled storage where it's still sitting a year later. And so for all those reasons, demand for apples was extremely low this year, and it left a lot of producers kind of screwed. With, for example, one grower who had nowhere to sell the bulk of her apples for the first time in 36 years telling NPR, imagine 80% of your income is sitting on the trees and the processor tells you they don't want them. You've got your employees to worry about. You've got fruit on the trees that needs somewhere to go. What do you do? And so she and many other apple growers faced a tough decision. Either you pay a bunch of workers to pick the harvest and hope that a miracle buyer just comes along out of nowhere, or you save the money you would have spent on workers and just let the apples rot. And for many, the risk was just too high, and so they went with option two. But then the all-powerful, unquestionable, invisible hand of the market hath spoken. Those apples shall not die. Or rather, not that, but folks in West Virginia actually had another idea. But specifically, Senator Joe Manchin stepping into the picture. Because while his state only grows 1% of the nation's apples, he was like, we gotta step in. And so he put petitioned the U.S. Department of Agriculture to buy $10 million worth of apples from a dozen West Virginia growers, and specifically doing this under Section 32 of the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1935. And then, with that, the USDA donated the fruit to a network of charities feeding hungry people across the country. So all of a sudden, these nonprofits are virtually drowning in tens of millions of pounds of apples dumped on their doorstep by hundreds of trucks, with one food pantry volunteer even saying, I'm just bewildered. We have a warehouse full of apples and I can barely walk through it. As well as the head of another rescue in West Virginia saying, there's over a hundred billion pounds pounds of produce waste in this country every year. We only need 7 billion to drive food insecurity to zero. And with that added, we get to support farmers. We get to fight hunger with an apple. It's one of the most nutritional items we can get into the hands of the food insecure. And notably, what we saw there was just the start, because the USDA actually saw how well the program did in West Virginia and expanded it to other states as well, with it now announcing another $100 million worth of surplus apple buyouts, which is the largest purchase of its kind ever. But while we're seeing good news, unfortunately, it's not all good news, because right? the harvest season is coming to an end. And so many growers actually already let their apples rot. But for those who didn't, and for everyone during future harvest, this marks a major step in how the country handles food waste. Plus, seeing a demonstration like this of the government's ability to intervene in the market where it fails, it could highlight how we could do this in other sectors of the economy as well. And so all of that brings us to the main question, 
how you like them apples. And then there have been a number of developments in the Israel-Gaza war since we last covered it before Thanksgiving. On the ground, the long-awaited hostage exchange and associated truce is actually taking place. And over the first three days, Hamas released 58 people in exchange for 117 Palestinian people, with both sides primarily releasing women and children, although Hamas did also release some foreign nationals that they had abducted on their October 7th attack. The truce has also facilitated some conversation between the two sides, with American and Qatari mediators trying to get the truce extended. We actually now have word that that's essentially happened, with Qatar confirming that the truce would be extended by two days, meaning that Hamas agreed to release at least 20 more hostages. There's also reportedly been efforts to make sure that Hamas doesn't separate mothers or grandmothers from children in the hostage exchange, something that they promise not to do, but whether intentionally or not, have reportedly done. But overall, people are at least temporarily relieved that the fighting has stopped and that the hostages are finally being released. And with that, as you'd expect, there have been a lot of big reactions to the, the videos of people being reunited. We'll also likely continue to see these reunions happen in the short term, as families that are expected to be reunited today have been notified, according to the prime minister's office. But with all this, it should be noted that there are people opposed to the deal, especially among Israeli hardliners like National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir. And then, of course, there are those who criticize what they say is Israel's willingness to release prisoners that have been accused of attacking Israelis. And all this, while on the other side, there's still the critique that this essentially was the same deal that Hamas offered weeks ago, and saying 15,000 Palestinian deaths later, Israel didn't get anywhere close to eradicating Hamas. If Hamas is in tunnels, bombing buildings only kills civilians. Murdering Palestinian civilians was slash is the goal. But in the face of everything we just talked about, the ceasefire will reportedly continue and will continue for at least two more days. However, all of this, as seemingly elsewhere, things are becoming progressively more violent. We're seeing things like over in Quebec, a Jewish community center was hit by a Molotov cocktail. Fortunately there, no one was injured and the damage of the building ended up being minimal. Though that is hardly the only Jewish center or business to be targeted lately. And at the same time, you have Palestinians increasingly being targeted. Like over in Vermont, a 48-year-old man was arrested and charged with attempted murder for shooting three Palestinian college students. While he has since pled not guilty, the authorities allege that the three students Students were just walking on the street Saturday night when the man just walked up to them and without speaking a word, opened fire before running. And according to police, two of the victims are in stable condition, while a third received much more serious injuries. And this is the victims' families, along with civil rights groups, are urging investigators to seriously consider whether this was a hate-motivated crime. And there we saw Burlington Police Chief John Murad definitely not throwing that out the window, saying, in this charged moment, no one can look at this incident and not suspect that it may have been a hate-motivated crime. And according to the Council on American-Islamic Relations, all this comes as Muslims, Arabs, and Palestinians across the country report a surge in anti Muslim and anti-Arab hate since the escalation of violence in Palestine and Israel last month. And so actually with that, they're offering $10,000 for any information that leads to a conviction in this case. But also, unfortunately in this situation, there is a very strong chance that this will not be the last time a case like this happens. Nor is there any reason to believe that anti-Islamic or anti-Semitic related incidents are going to drop. With CARE reporting, there's been a more than 200% increase in anti-Arab and anti-Muslim incidents since Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th. And this is the ADL says there's been a 400% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in the U.S. So keep an eye out for your neighbors because things just appear to be getting rougher and rougher right now. And then finally today, let's talk about the last show. We talked about a lot of news stories, but when we dove into those comments, it was really about primarily one topic. Stuart Seldowitz and those disgusting rants. Y'all saying things like, imagine being a diplomat and then going to some random food vendor and threatening to get his father tortured. Absolutely disgusting behavior. Others saying, it's funny how you said the street vendor had the patience of a saint. And arguing the only reason this is on the news is because it was a politician. This literally happens daily from all sorts of sources. If the street vendor did anything, he could risk attacks or an arrest. Lots of my coworkers experience horrible racism day after day and just have to take it and move on. Others writing, holy shit, he legit just threatened to get this dude's parents' fingernails pulled. I want to stop on that for a minute because to lots of us in the U.S., this sounds like some gross cartoonish nonsense. But all of this hate and drama is attached to places where things like that and worse really happen. And on the note of how extreme it was, you had people saying, you know you messed up when a lobbying company fires you over moral issues. So there, I think it's less about moral issues and more about exposure issues. But ultimately, we're going to have to wait to see how things play out. You know, he's since been arrested and charged with hate crimes and stalking and has pled not guilty. Also saying in an interview, I regret the whole thing happened and I'm sorry. But you know, in the heat of the moment, I said things that probably I shouldn't have said. But for now, we'll have to wait to see what happens legally. But ultimately, that is where your daily dive into the news is going to end today. As always, thank you for watching. My name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you right back here tomorrow for more news.